Hello and welcome to um, Engaging and Empowering School Libraries, a podcast that aims to raise the profile of school libraries by talking about topics that are current across education and teaching. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts and school librarians Ruth Maloney and Sabrina Cox. Tonight we're going to talk about graphic novels and their role in raising literacy levels. I want to welcome special guests Paul Register, school librarian and founder of the Excelsior Awards, which I'm sure he'll tell us more about during our conversation tonight, and Rebecca Simpson Hargreaves, lecturer in education at the University of Manchester, who I caught posting up pictures of graphic novels on Twitter the other day and now and realised that she'd be perfect for tonight's discussion. So I think we should start with an introduction um, from yourselves, to be honest with you, um, telling me a little bit about your role and, and your link, even if it's tenuous, to graphic novels. So let's start with Paul. Welcome tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, right, do you want, do you want a, 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 my history as a reader or my history as a professional librarian? Well, just how you got into the graphic novel side of reading I suppose what what sparked your interest in graphic novels as a school, um, was it a school librarian thing or was it something else no I think um I, to be honest I was talking to another school librarian about this recently uh, one of the judges on my Excelsior award and uh, we had a very similar kind of path where um, we both started reading comics um, when we were about seven or eight <clears throat> which were back then it was it was black and white reprints of American superhero books. Um, and then we read comics and graphic novels for quite a long time. And then we stopped when we went to university. Right. And she said she stopped because um, we were both studying. What did she study? Politics, I think. We were, she was reading weighty things, you know, so she had to park all that to one side, the reading for pleasure of her life, really, yeah. uh, and, and get on with her studies. Um, and I was studying English literature, so I kind of did the same thing. Um, although my reason for doing so was probably more finance led than anything else. I just couldn't afford to buy the sheer amount of monthly comics I was buying at that time. Yeah. Um, and then you sort of come out the end of it and you start rediscovering all this stuff again. And being a school librarian means you can kind of do it in a more professional kind of circle as well, I guess. Okay. Um, so so, so do you think you've come across more graphic novels because of being a school librarian or, or is it the other way around? No, I think, um, yeah, definitely so. I mean, I mean, the work I do with, with the Excelsior Award, I, I have to be on top of what's coming out mm. all the time. I have to be, you know, in sync with, with whatever's current. Yeah. So I'm always reading things with an eye on the next year's awards shortlist in mind. Right. So yeah, I um whereas a lot of school librarians will read a lot of like young adult fiction because That's... they want to connect that way. Yeah. Um I have to kind of keep on top of up to date graphic novels, Absolutely. which is a labor of love in many respects. <laughs> you know. It sounds lovely. We'll come back to to the Excelsior Awards in a minute, but I just want to welcome uh, Rebecca. Can you just explain a little bit about what you do and, and what your you know when I saw your post about um graphic novels the other day on Twitter what was what was all that about why what what is the interest for you I suppose um well I started reading graphic novels and comics uh, at such a really really young so I grew up um, abroad and it's just part and parcel of everyday life over there um so you know starting off with, with uh things like you know, getting English comics over there, like Beano, Dandy, going out and spending my money on it, but also things like Tantan and your Asterix and uh, all of those wonderful kind of um, really rich text bits that you get over there. So it's always been something that I've sort of grown up with, really. And then coming over here, and first of all, I trained as a primary teacher, and I don't remember looking at graphic novels at all during my course, sort of being... Uh, my primary teacher course yeah, it's quite and I specialised in children's literature and it was only really uh, to look at them again and started rediscovering them and and I'm really pleased to say that particularly within the primary age phase it, they're starting to get more and more into there so when I became the teacher trainer 
um, visual literacy has always been something that I've been really interested in. It, it's part of my research. So he was like, right, okay, I need to then start expanding my own um, knowledge of, of what's out there. And there are so many wonderful people who can inspire and, and booksellers and librarians such as yourselves that can give really good recommendations. Now, what you saw was me using graphic novels as part of my Teach the Readers Reading for Pleasure group. Um, it's in combination with the Open University and the UK Literacy Association. And we meet up once every term or every half term and we talk about different types of books. So it was, right, let's see about graphic novels and how we can expand the knowledge of graphic novels so we can get them into children's hands, but also to let teachers know that they aren't, I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but know that they're not inferior to other books. If anything, I think they're probably superior to, to other <laughs> books, but I could rant about that for quite some time. But yes, yeah, so it, it's all part and parcel of, of what I do uh, as a teacher trainer, but also I, I teach on various other courses, including a master's, and, and it, it's looking at navigating the visual literacy world, but through um, sort of the graphic novel elements. That's fascinating. You know, it's 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 something that has, as a as a school librarian, uh, my role with supporting school libraries uh, as a school's library service, and and putting graphic novels into schools. It's funny how they're not always seen and recognised as good quality. Um, so so I suppose I'm going to start with my first question. Is is you know what are graphic novels and how do they differ from other novels and aren't they just comics paul <laughs> um <clears throat> thank you the way i used to um describe them to kids myself was as posh comics okay. um the, the term itself graphic novel can cause a little bit of um, friction a little bit of argument amongst people certainly amongst comics writers and comics artists um but there are a lot of examples of graphic novels that are made up of comics that have already been published and certainly with marvel and dc who are the two biggest publishers of graphic novels and comics in the world what they will do is they will run monthly comics of maybe 25 to 30 pages and then they will collect them together into a, a format where they might have one to six issues of a, a comic run okay. and they'll do it on better paper and they'll do it with a nice sort of semi hard cover um, so in that regard that's why I call them posh comics because they are just comics really but we but at the same time they're not they've got to be differentiated from comics because comics are very you know one ninety nine, two ninety nine, 99 very just papery disposable Whereas a graphic novel is a collection of comics, and so you wouldn't really read it once and throw it in the bin. You would, you would keep it. So, so is the vocabulary in a in a graphic novel better than a comic? Similar to a comic? Better than a novel? Um, well, <clears throat> I mean, the vocabulary can be very good if you're adapting Shakespeare or Dickens into a graphic novel format. It's no different, really. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, it's um, it's it is it is a funny one. It's it's difficult to describe. I mean, there are graphic novels today that are published in their own rights and aren't connected to um, comics. D didn't exist as comics beforehand. Um, we had this strange kind of idea of like a reading ladder. I was finding this in this country where kids start off quite young with baby books and then they sort of graduate to picture books and then it's sort of lower ability um, novels and then higher ability novels and we seem to keep climbing up this literacy ladder and graphic novels don't seem to find any way in no. which is a bit odd in some respects I don't quite know why they're on the outside of this all the time okay can but... I just bring can I bring Ruth in she's got a question mm. yeah I'm interested in in this question about what graphic novels are, because it seems to encompass a breadth of texts that no other genre would be expected to cover. So, I mean, you're talking about kind of Marvel and DC, and then I think about uh, something like Heartstopper, which has got to be at the moment our absolutely favourite. But you know, texts mm. like Mouse, uh, Spielman's Mouse, that's a that's a 
uh, we don't do A-level, but that's an A-level equivalent text in our school, you know, and really deserves some analysis and is a standalone novel. It's not a collection. Yeah, yeah. It was never written in another form, you know, and is, and then there are books like, um, I often think about the Marvels, which is half novel, half images, which is a really interesting mix of graphic novel. I yeah. can't think of another genre which is expected to encompass all of these things. And we dismiss so quickly with the term, oh, it's a graphic novel. Mm. You know, they're incomparable for me, you know, DC comic and, you know, something like Mouse. They're not trying to achieve the same thing. They're not aimed at the no, same audience no. necessarily. Um, so I agree with you, I entirely agree, but there isn't a, a rung on the ladder for the graphic novels, partly, I suppose, because they're doing, they are so varied. One, one thing I will pick up about, if you don't mind, is um, don't think of graphic novels as a genre. Um, okay. they, they're, just a, they're just a storytelling medium. Okay, yeah. So if you think of it like normal novels, you can have all different manner of genres within normal novels. It's exactly the same with graphic novels. Yep. The only difference is you get more pictures in graphic novels. <laughs> That's pretty Fair much enough. it, really, if you want to boil it down, you know? Yeah. Um, the, on, the only reason people get um, confused is too strong a word, but people make that error is because graphic novels, because of the output of the two biggest publishers, which is Marvel and DC, being largely superhero, which is a genre, you know, yep. um, that tends to dominate everything. So everyone, people seem to think that comics and graphic novels are just superheroes. And it's a lovely little sort of niche idea when people start adapting um, like Romeo and Juliet into a graphic novel format. It's like, oh, we never thought of that before. It can be done. There's no reason why it can't be. Yeah. Rebecca, when you're talking to teachers then about graphic novels, trainee teachers about graphic novels, what's usually the reaction to them? Actually, the reaction's usually really welcome. Um, they're really seen as, uh, as something that is really interesting. So I do something called slow reading um, with graphic novels. So I'll put a spread um, under the visualizer and they get little um, tiny little viewfinders and they literally have to go from panel to panel um, and, and kind of look through. And then they have to think about what does the gut mean? What, you know, thinking about, the language and the grammar that goes along with, with graphic novels and comics, etc., and learning how to navigate them and reading slowly really gets them to zone in and think about, okay, well, this character's eyes are doing this, but the words are saying this. So how, how are they kind of working with one or another or against one another? What can it tell? So we talk about how they're really incredibly complex multimodal texts, because that's what they are. You know, you've got that pictorial images with the written text, you know, sequential form, that kind of aesthetic response, reader response, which is something I'm really interested in that, that really kind of sucks you in. Um, and it's such a careful balance between that visual and textual and the design. But, and it's also for me, I think, particularly for student teachers, but also for pupils, um, particularly, I'm, I mean, I'm primary phase, so that's kind of the way I look at it. And it's interesting that Ruth mentioned mouse for A-level, because we use sections of mouse with year six and I say sections, not all of it, because obviously there are some bits that are just, you know, not suitable for 11 year olds, but it's, they're so rich. And I think that they can span different age groups. And I think that's also the real sort of um, attraction of it. But it, it, it's okay. that developing those, those strategies and, and to look at really. And it, hearing about the ladder is all Awful, can I just say we are breaking that down in primary as much as we can um, because you know uh, picture books we are always constantly fighting against that picture books shouldn't be used in key stage two alongside with graphic novels but actually you know there are so many sophisticated ones out there that you would not use absolutely mm -hmm. wouldn't use and I think it's something that's coming from you know quite old ideas that oh if, if you can't read a proper novel then you have to read something like a graphic novel but they're you know they're so complicated and actually when you when you unpick them properly the strategies the, the skills the understanding that they have to do to be able to kind of read it and the the ability to provoke such powerful emotion 
we were always saying to children, you need to write more, you need to write more, you need to write more. Well, actually, that's often waffle. <laughs> it's like say. You can get really big novels that say not a lot. And, and I think this is unfortunately an impact from the governmental push on, you know, for, for, for writing for exams, for example, so you have to write as much as humanly possible. But if you can get across such a powerful range of emotions in only a few words and few image and that, and that interplay, then surely that's really what we're looking for. Absolutely. Um, I, I must admit, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you about picture books being used for older students. Um, you know, the, we're going off topic slightly, but the Greenaway books being used in, in secondary schools with students that, you know, are engaging with the pictures and, and what you can read through the pictures is hugely beneficial to them. Um, and I I think that that the more you talk, both of you, the, the skill set in reading a graphic novel is something that I probably wasn't very aware of myself. So, you know, we're talking about graphic novels being something as as something that's complex, but but do we talk about them being good for you like we talk about reading a novel is good for you in the same way, do you think? But I, it's I think funny. I've not heard of that before. That something is, that reading a novel is good for you. I don't know. Maybe it's because uh, I maybe I don't read enough novels. Um, <laughs> I think it, after after picking them apart so much in secondary, it kind of put me off for a while. Um, but I don't. I don't know. What do you mean by good for you? Well, I think it's more along the lines of the fact that it's good for your mental health, isn't it? If you read a fiction book, it's. Um, good for your vocabulary because you're you know engaging with more words it's it's that kind of good but but actually the way you're talking sounds to me like graphic novels are probably more <laughs> better for you really on a par. I mean for for me and I'm thinking about kind of young children and, and looking at get the world of gaming so um I've recently read quite a lot of Minecraft books I love playing Minecraft but my children are into Minecraft and that's how it kind of came to me and I've got a few Minecraft graphic novels and thinking about young children and how they're you know they're, they're getting the vocabulary is huge because they're coming across it you know words like smelting and furnace and prismarine uh, and all of those types of things they wouldn't normally come across are being introduced in in, in the graphic novel oh. genre and you know with the, and they're accessing that because they're interested in the topic that they're in as well absolutely paul can i bring you back in uh, yes i was just gonna it just reminded me then talking about vocabulary that um one of the most famous comics writers ever of all time is probably stan lee oh, yes. and um if you ever if you ever look up any interviews with stan lee about um his writing style when he first started writing comics in the 60s he always talks about using a college level vocabulary that's the phrase he used as far as he was concerned, he wasn't interested in talking down to kids. He wanted to present them with a level of vocabulary that would raise them up to his level. Um, and I suppose you can do that more if you have a picture of <coughs> words, because it, there's your explanation. If you don't necessarily understand the word you're reading, you've got more, you know, you know, we talk about you know, children having to to read the sentence to gain understanding of, of particular words. Whereas I suppose with a graphic novel, you can push that boundary even further because you are providing a tool for them to to help them navigate that. Is that do you think that's why it, it was done that way? It's this, it, yeah, that's a little bit of it. Um, but I, I mean, when Stan himself was writing comics, there was a, a greater emphasis on descriptive um, boxes attached to the the panels, the comics panels. As as the decades have gone on, I think comics artists have become more sophisticated, and they don't tend to use that kind of descriptive text quite so much. They let the story and the pictures kind of flow in a maybe better way, and, yeah. and carry the story forward. But in the sixties, seventies, eighties, you would see a lot more descriptive passages, and descriptive passages re required the phrase I always used to like with Stan that you still see on comics covers today is senses shattering, which is <laughs> just a crazy phrase. Nobody ever uses that in real life, 
but it, it, it would be like a, a like a hook that you would get people in it would be undercover you know senses yeah. shattering first issue yeah and it's like whoa you know can you imagine reading the words senses shattering when you're seven years old <laughs> this is not easy stuff you know <laughs> no not at all not at all so would you say that we're missing out on something if you don't read a graphic novel and and you know is it is it is it something that we should be encouraging all our students to to try at least one uh rebecca can i bring you back in yeah absolutely and i think there is um there is one for everyone out there picking up on your previous point about helping children to navigate who may not be um, up on their reading level, as it were, who may need a little bit more, more support. But graphic novels are really useful for children who might have English as an additional language. Um, you, know, you, can, you can both share the text together. So if you want children reading together, you know, that can, and they can understand what's going on and it can be really supportive. Um, but in terms of, you know, thinking about trying to get them into the hands of children it's like Paul was saying you know I've got some great graphic novels that look at classical literature or look at myths and legends so I've got one of Beowulf I've got one of um that looks like an adaptation from um uh, the Baker Street um Irregulars that were part of Sherlock Holmes etc I'm looking next to me so I've got loads, <laughs> loads on the side of me um so we've got Alex Ryder so we've, we've got there's such a range out there and I think that that's what's so lovely about it is if you know if you're into magical elements you can find magical element books if you're into sort of poetic ones you can find some that go on there there really is you know as Paul was saying it, it's endless on there and it certainly is something I feel like you are missing out on that opportunity um just like any reading diet you need to have a balanced reading diet you know and find out ones that you like and that you don't like and uh, it's really useful in terms of helping them to also navigate kind of the digital world and it's enjoyable let's not, <laughs> yeah. let's not forget the reading for pleasure element of it we want children to read for pleasure absolutely <clears throat> like I said you know I did used to read comics as a child um being no and dandy but but never i can't say i've ever i've i've obviously handled flicked through graphic novels um i can't say i've ever read one cover to cover this is shocking what a... <laughs> i have horrid faces on my screen <laughs> um so i will endeavor to put that right <laughs> we'll, we'll give you some recommendations thank you paul <laughs> so we, we are librarians it's what we do absolutely so so that leads me very nicely on to my next question which is where do you start to build a solid graphic novel collection for the whole school you know i the schools that i you know so it's a few years since i was in a in a school library properly but most graphic novel collections were very much on a shelf and actually funnily enough Paul the fact that you said that we should be um you know they are across genre so yeah. so I suppose there's several questions there should they be shelved separately or should they be shelved and they you know on the in, in the right genre or alphabetically with all the other novels how, how would it work oh. so where, where do I start Paul <laughs> well one of the things that um, library management software systems tend to do, which really gets my goat, is that when you're cataloging new books and you know you can you can scan the barcode and it will fill in the details for you to a certain degree. When it says classification, it will always give you 741, which is the arts books. Okay, yes. Which is just horribly wrong because they're not just art books and you don't want them there. And frankly, if you kept them with the art books, nobody would read them. No because yeah. you want them where the fiction stuff is. Yeah. Um, so I, I do keep mine. I've always kept mine in, in a separate area. Um, it, it just looks nicer. You know, if you can get them cover out as well, it just looks good. It's a, you've got to make it an attractive area. So do you think it's do you think that children who read graphic novels are likely to stay with graphic novels or or if they're if they're looking for they, if they're looking for a graphic novel, they just want to find that is what they want to find. Um, is that one of the reasons you keep them separate? Do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. But you, you've also you've got the issue that um, I found with Doctor Who novels as well is that 
I mean, I don't know how other librarians keep their fiction sections. I keep mine by author alphabetically, yeah. which I think is what most people do, to be fair. Yeah. Um, now, if you had six Spider-Man graphic novels, you might have six different authors there. So where you might be, uh, like if you had a collection of Harry Potters, they'd all be under R for Rowling. All your doll books would be together. Yeah, which is great for the kids because if the kids like Roald Dahl books, they know exactly where they are. Absolutely. So if you're taking those six Spider-Man books and you're putting them at, at B, um, C, yeah. F, yeah. X, you know, that's not helping anybody because the kids will, the kids who haven't got the confidence to ask you will just assume you've only got that one Spider-Man book. And if they've that's read it, they won't come back for it anymore because they'll yes. think, well, I've read that now. So you've got to keep them all together. In order to uh, be, you, you, you've got to make it simple. You've got to make it easy for the kids to navigate what's on your shelves. So yeah, I do I always keep them apart from the fiction and separate from the fiction. Yeah. Would you say that your graphic novel collection is much smaller than than obviously your fiction collection? Is there as many graphic novels available? <coughs> this is a question. Um. Oh yeah. I, I, yeah. My graphic novel selection in my current school is maybe four or five shelves. Okay which is probably less than 10% of the regular fiction section. Yeah. Um, uh, that's because that's the number that have been published or? No, no, it, it's... it's um, percentage of students that read them. I, I think if it's, if I'm being honest, it's um, graphic novels do still tend to be a little bit niche. Right. So um you i don't really see as you would have more than you would your regular fiction um, okay. but a good balance is is good um just, yeah. and you do have to have plenty you can't just get away with buying 20 for example and and, and hoping that's enough no absolutely. Um, just get in as many as you can there's also an expense issue as well um a lot of them do tend to be a little bit more expensive than regular fiction Okay, that's something I didn't know. That's interesting. But I suppose oh, yeah. they take more effort to produce because yeah, of all the... Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's a lot more in involved in them. The paper quality is better. Uh, some of them will be imported from the States or Europe, Japan. So there's, um, yeah. Okay. Ruth, uh, Sabrina, sorry, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in? I, I, I just wanted to say that I've my graphic novel collection, I've been building up as much as I can over the last four years. So I actually have three shelves of graphic novels and I've kind of got them organised with general graphic novels, novel adaptations. So like the Charles Dickens and the Jane Austens that are out there and the Alex Riders. And then I have um, a spinner where I put all my manga and my TV tie-in books like the Doctor Who's and that, they go on there. My biggest problem is space. I don't have yeah. the, the space to <coughs> play as many graphic novels as I would like because I have found the, the boom in reading graphic novels at the moment has just been astronomical in our school and it's lovely to see. But yeah, they are great things. Why, why do you think that they've suddenly boomed? I think purely because our local primary schools don't have them in stock. Um, and the older students who have finally decided to come back into the library, having hated the library for so many years, have discovered actually we have Marvel and DC in the library for the first time ever. And it's like, oh, we want to read these graphic novels that have never been on the shelves. So it, a lot of it is word has got around in the school that Miss has got these books in and you can ask for things and they're really excited about it. Which is good, but obviously if they're expensive, the budget is tight, then, then yes. it's, it's that balance, isn't it, between more of them or more of your normal fiction, I suppose. Well, it, it's, it's just a question of being clever with your budget as well, and clever with your funding. Yeah. So you, you, you can get it all, you can get stuff in without having to spend a, a lot of money, you know? Um, I mean, the Excelsior Award that I run, we, we try and keep budgets in mind when we put shortlists together. So... Any any shortlist we put on that, which will be five books, I think this year we said it wouldn't cost more than sixty five pounds. Okay. Um, so ex explain a little bit more about the Excelsior Awards and how that came about, Paul, for me. All right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the Excelsior Awards started as a um, a guest section of the Sheffield Children's Book Award in two thousand and ten, um, and the organisers of that award 
um, they they had a guest award every year. So some years it would be poetry, some years it would be baby books. I think they even had a bath books one once, you know, books yeah. that you could put in the bath with a kid. Um, and one year they decided they wanted to do graphic novels. Um, the downside for them was that they had nobody on their staff that knew anything about graphic novels. So they asked me to get involved and it was all a bit last minute, but we cobbled together quite a nice shortlist. Um, and honest to God, I can't remember what won that year. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long time ago now. I honest kind of can't remember. Um, but the year after I went back to them and I said, I've got a lot of ideas of how we can make it better this year. I think we've, we've really hit something there. We've really tapped into something because the kids at the Sheffield schools who were taking part have been really enthusiastic about it and been really up for it. Um, and their response was, well, we're not doing it in 2011 because it, it was only ever a one-off. So I said, oh, okay, fine. So I started doing it myself nice. um, in collaboration with the school I was working at at the time. Um, and we just picked it up and we carried it on. And we had, I think, 17 schools do it the first year. Uh, we had uh, maybe, I think, about 12 across Sheffield. And we had several more who strangely caught wind of what we were doing just outside of Sheffield. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how. I think they just heard things on, on the internet uh, and emailed me and said, can we join in? So I said, yeah, okay, that's fine. More the merrier. Um, so we had 17 in the first year. And then the second year, 2012, I decided to open it up nationally because there was clearly some sort of hunger there for this sort, sort of thing. Um, and we had 77 schools. Wow do it um and so we've just been going since then really and um, we've made tweaks along the way we've made evolutions i like to call them and, and yeah. adaptations um we used to have eight books on one shortlist uh, and then a few years ago we introduced a primary school version um and then we sort of subsumed that into the main excelsior award so now we have four different awards for four different age categories Okay. Uh, we have white, blue, red, and black. White being for primary, blue being for years seven, eight, and nine, red being for years nine and ten, and black being for six formers, which means okay. you can put the really sweary books in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find many six formers join in? Um, the blue and the red ones are definitely still the more popular ones, but it's just nice to be able to offer something to primary into six form. Absolutely. Um, they don't come in the same numbers, but it's and it would be nice if they did. But we do get, yeah, we do get some, yeah. It's it's nice to see. Fantastic. So so is there a difference between manga and graphic novels, or would you say that they're part and parcel of the same thing? Um, manga just means Japanese comics, so. Okay. In that respect, no, there's not a lot of difference. Um, I'm sure Sabrina will agree with me, but manga looks absolutely beautiful when it's on the shelves or on the spinner. Just seeing this long row of, of books that are all the same height. If you've got OCD, <laughs> just, just get some manga. It's marvellous. Just these, these rows of series of books look fantastic. Um, so, yeah, there is, a, there is a difference. There is a cultural difference because they are... They are produced in Japan and then they're translated into English by American publishers. Nice. And then we import them basically from, from America. Okay. Uh, that's, how, that's how most of the manga publishers you'll see in the UK operate. Rebecca, can I bring you back in? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the, <laughs> well, I was just thinking about how you organize the, the library shelves you would have a heart attack if you saw mine I do mine by theme so <laughs> it would uh, think you make your head explode um but in terms of you know manga being that distinct genre as well I think it's in terms of obviously having the similar structures to sort of the graphic novel elements of it and, and the themes that they cover from action and adventure etc um it's that element as well I think from reading from right to left instead of left to right you know from the back of the book to the front as it were um that sometimes children can find that there's quite a nice book in as well uh, as something to do but you know I think this is but it is bearing in mind that in terms of the the way that they are kind of categorized you need to be quite careful um so you know uh, in terms of they're usually in broad categories relating to sort of age and even gender um I've yet to find ones that are 
you've got like the shonen for sort of teen boys and the shoujo for, for your for your girls or teen girls and then you've got your komodo for your young children um kodomo or even not komodo that's a dragon um <laughs> so it's categorized first really by audience and and then by genre so it's it's nice if you've got a uh, people is really interested in magic you know and if they i identify as male then you might go right well have a look first in shown in ma magic manga um you know things like my hero academia is really really popular amongst you know all genders and I, and I find for me personally i find it very uncomfortable to genderize you know um books i think and things should be read by everybody but it, it's that just making sure that that you don't accidentally go right i'm going to go and buy a load of manga for my, for my school library and and you're not looking they usually have quite helpful um, things on the back that tell you if it's for teen, etc. Okay. Just be quite careful for that because there are some that are specifically for adults and they are very over sexualized and it's just like, oh, she's suddenly got her breasts out. Where's that come from? <laughs> um, and it's kind of not really quite appropriate for little <laughs> children. Absolutely. Absolutely. So things like, you know, the Pokemon, etc. Uh, and your um the other ones that are kind of based on on books like Zelda and stuff like that is is quite safe on there. So one of the, one of the things that I'm aware of when we bought um, manga, it, it tends to run in very long series. Oh my goodness, and it's really expensive. As a parent of a child who loves yeah. manga, I think so, we're on we're on number five, and I think there's fourteen. <laughs> so so as a school librarian, would you recommend they buy the first? five or six or do you think you you have to, you bought a set uh, they started the series so you have to uh, stay with it what do you reckon yeah my my policy has often been um if there's no cheap cheap um cheap ish box sets available if you're trying something new a new series that you don't quite know if it'll be popular i always used to buy the first four right and if the first four are popular buy the next four and so on and so on right and judge it that way really yeah, because it's very difficult because it's what, yeah, 14 or 15 in a series, it's not money you want to be spending if it's definitely not. Oh, there's, there's series that are in the 60s now. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. but I think just you very, can, very, very long running series. I sorry. You can find, well, sorry. I think you can find ones that you know are going to be popular. So you can, like the yeah. Amulet books, they're, they're always really, really popular staples. So you know that they're going to be out quite a lot. So you probably wouldn't, you know, you can get, I think there's only about eight six or eight in the series of that so it's not too bad but you know definitely uh buying a whole load of 15 is uh it's quite a monetary commitment <laughs> absolutely ruth can i bring you back in yeah i mean this is a proper librarian's point um and goes back to something that paul said earlier my part of my difficulty with manga is not just the massive series runs but the quality of the publication they don't last. The kids read them very quickly. So there's there's a high turnover, which means they're in a lot of hands, which means they're falling apart. I'm paying, I mean, I bought a set of 16 Tokyo Ghouls the other day, 90 pounds. And, you know, even plastic bound and, you know, looked after, they just aren't that that's a really difficult buy for me particularly for the manga less so for the um, more you know for the more standard graphic novels because they do tend to be better quality print the pages last longer it's a really boring librarian point and if they were mine at home I wouldn't care I would agree the lovely run of them on the shelf all of that stuff but from a school library point of view they're really tricky despite how popular they are yeah, that is one of the problems, isn't it? I suppose is that is that you know, if something is popular, it's going to get read, and if it's got read, it's <laughs> it's not supposed to read them. <laughs> They're there to look at on the shelves. What are they doing? <laughs> um, let's just just change the subject ever so slightly and take the conversation back to the reluctant reader that reads a graphic novel. Um, and I think I know the answer to this question before I ask it, having listened to you both talking so far, is that is there a is there a need for somebody, a child who reads a graphic novel to transition to proper novels, if that's the right word? Um, or do you think 
then actually if you've got them hooked on graphic novels then they don't need to transition to anything else what do you reckon paul um no i don't, I don't think there's any requirement to transition or ever leave graphic novels if, if you don't want to to be perfectly honest um i would make that argument with something like audio books as well perhaps yeah yeah, yeah. um if it's if it's what you enjoy and it's it's what's getting you reading uh, then stick with it. I don't. I don't see it as being a stepping stone to anything else in in that regard. Um, perhaps a stepping stone to higher quality graphic novels. Okay. Um, there's a. I mean, in terms of reading ability, there's a world of difference between Simpsons comics, for example, yeah. and um, a fantastic biography on George Orwell that I read last year. Right. You know, they're both aimed at very different people. The Simpsons book is definitely aimed at the 12 year old lads. And this or this Orwell biography is is aimed at people like me. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this this idea that um, it's just for reluctant readers um, is, is no more valid than it is with regular novels, I would say. Okay. Um, and I don't think there's any need to, to transition over in any way, really. No. So Rebecca, let's bring you back in. Dealing with working with training teachers, do you think that that if you were to say that to the teachers that you're training, that they would accept that? Or do you think that they would be oh, wanting to do transition? <laughs> it's really interesting because my question is, should you have a transition text? The idea of transition text, I mean, yeah. already there, you're saying that one type of book is better than another. And this is why, I mean, we sometimes have problems with, you know, and it's things that I've come across when I've sort of done CPD for teachers, is that it's kind of that old throwover, or, you know, we've mentioned it before, it's not a proper book, because it is a proper book. And it, it's almost as well as getting rid of that, in the embarrassment that some children feel that they may enjoy it. So I always say to them, and I always say to teachers, and I always say to my trainees as well, that during reading for pleasure time, you should be reading these in front of the children, reading alongside the children so that they can see that actually they are completely valid. Um, however, I'm very realistic in that some people are quite old school and they feel very much that, you know, what well, they need, you know, they can use it as a stepping stone. And I think you can. And I think having that knowledge of us, how to do it, you know, is absolutely fine. So say, for example, um, Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book. So the, graphic, the Graveyard Book, Volume 1, Number 2, the, gra the graphic novels are absolutely, they're just fantastic. Um, but I also have a copy of The Graveyard Book novel. Now, interestingly, I started reading the novel first and I couldn't get into it. And I bought the graphic novels and that was it. I demolished them completely. Nice. And obviously they have the same story and it's just a different way of, of you know igniting your interest in there and I may go back to, to have a read of the novel but I may not likewise with with the Hilda you know you've got Hilda novels alongside the Hilda graphic novels so you know you could put them next to each other on the shelf if you wish to you know and if children want to after they've read the graphic novel dip into the novels or likewise the other way around and then they can but I feel in terms of um should they be transitions? No, just as Paul said, read whatever you want to read. I mean, as adults, how many of you stick to the same kind of book? I mainly read poetry, information books, and graphic novels, and picture books. And that's about it. <laughs> so, I don't know what that says about my reading diet. <laughs> I think it sounds perfect. Paul, can I bring you back in? Um, yeah, so Rebecca just reminded me of a, a story I've told many, many times to many, many kids and staff, really. So some people might have already heard this, but um, at one of the schools I used to work at uh, a long time ago, there was a, a teacher, an English teacher who brought his class in, a group of year eights for a reading lesson. And he did what was the right thing to do at that time. He just said to all the kids, right, you've got five minutes to pick a book. And then I want you all sat down quietly reading the book for the rest of the period. Right, that's fine. That works great for me. Um, so all the kids sort of buzzed around for five minutes, had a good browse, picked off picked what they want to read, sat down. And there was one year eight boy who was stood at the graphic novel section, which had which happened to be right behind where I was sat, right behind my computer. And he was reading a graphic novel called uh, Planet Hulk, which is um, a, a, it's a big, hefty book. It's about 400 pages. And 
it's a, a lot of the storyline was pinched for the Thor Ragnarok film, actually. Um, so it's got it's got some welly, it's got some quality. Um, and he was stood reading it, and I just I must admit because I was irritated because he was in my eye line, I said to this lad, "Why don't you take that and sit down with it?" And this was a lad whose whose reading age was not particularly high, um, and had never really caught the reading bug up to that point. And so I said, "Why don't you sit down with that book and read it?" And he just closed it and said, no, everyone will set the mick out of me. Oh, and he no. just put it back on the shelf, wandered off and just randomly picked up another book. He didn't even look at it, picked up a normal prose novel and sat down and just pretended to read that for the next 45 minutes. And it's like, oh, it was just one of those heartbreaking moments. It was just so sad that this, this kid who may have found something he really, really wanted to read kind of felt he couldn't do it Absolutely. because of peer pressure or teacher judgment or whatever it might have been but really yeah. just didn't want to didn't want to be labeled as the kid reading planet hulk can i bring sabrina in yeah just following on from that i think that's why rebecca's point about teachers modeling reading graphic novels and manga you know i've always got my book that i'm reading on the the table beside me and they see some really weird stuff because i read science fiction and fantasy and um but I read manga as well so that would be on my desk and I think moments like that if that lad had seen that you were reading a manga or a graphic novel or he'd seen a teacher reading it it would have just given him that little boost of actually no that's okay to go and pick up and I think that's where our role as librarians and teachers is just so important to to be constantly modeling that it doesn't matter what you read as long as you're enjoying it it's okay absolutely Rebecca I think some of the reading for pleasure strategies that, that kind of we talk about and, and thinking about using them within the library is you can do like blind date with a book. So you can cover the, you know, cover the whole book itself and they don't know what they've got and they get to take that home and they get to read it and they don't know what it is. Or it, it's almost like, or you would you like this reading menu when it's got different suggestions that, that go on and like it. If you like this, if you like this film, you may like this book, et cetera, and have that in there. We are really trying to get um, more graphic novels within teacher planning as well with particularly I mean obviously I can only speak for the primary section but um because we have a lot more freedom in primary because obviously we choose the books that we share with the class we choose what our planning will be we're not we haven't got set text that we have to cover so I know particularly within year six they are looking at a lot of graphic novels and using them as as a base to to do planning um senior series of, of um, lessons on and i'm hoping that that will then filter in and, and take away some of the embarrassment of when they do go up into high school to be able to choose kind of any any books that are on there absolutely that's really good to hear is the fact that it you know it is it is become more normalized that that you know it is seen that a graphic novel can be used within within a teaching to with as a teaching tool which is fantastic which is really good well, I've just noticed the time and it's already nearly five to eight so I'm going to bring the conversation to a close um but before I do I want to do a brief opportunity to promote my membership to any schools looking for ways to boost independent learning literacy and well-being through your school library if you're not sure how to make this happen my membership program offers training and support for school librarians and teachers and creates opportunities to engage across the curriculum. You can find more information in the link in the show notes below. So just to finish off, I have one last question for you all. Um, what would your final message be to those considering um, starting to build a graphic novel section in their school library? Can I go with, can I go with, well, I'm gonna go with um, Paul. What would you say first? Um, I do actually get asked this question quite a lot anyway. Um, and two things I would recommend. One is slightly self-serving, but it is common sense as well. Um, I always guide them to my Excelsior World website. And I say, Absolutely. if you've got a certain amount of budget you want to spend on graphic novels, have a look at the shortlisted books from the, from the past years on there. And moreover, have a look at the winners, because the winners you know have been popular. Absolutely. Well, I, I will add the link to the show notes to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a perfect way to, to, to end for you, Paul. Thank you very much. And Thank Rebecca, you. do you have any final words? Yeah, absolutely. I can go for it. 
So um, particularly for any primary librarians or any primary colleagues, etc., cetera, um, but also tipping into lower key stage uh, three. Um, there are really good graphic novel bloggers out there, graphic novel people on Twitter. Uh, one of my favorites is Richard Ruddock. Um, he has a Padlet site, which is an absolute gold mine, and you can find the link on his Twitter page, or I could pass it on so then you can pass it on afterwards. Also visiting um, Just Imagine website that has um, loads of different books that are reviewed by teachers, by librarians, um, etc. And if you're not quite sure whether or not the book would be suitable for you know, children or whatever they are, or if, if a child just says, I'm really interested in this, um, they're completely um, there just for you to just kind of pop in their search engine reviews and, and they'll give you really good honest reviews. Um, I'm a reviewer on this. <laughs> I know that we, we, we are encouraged to give very honest uh, reviews on them. Um, and just also have a look at what's in your, in your local bookshops and obviously in your local library as well. Um, get down there. The more we can encourage, hopefully the more that um, the council can get into our library storage. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so thanks for joining me today, Paul and Rebecca. Um, it's been really interesting to chat with you. I hope that we have managed to get some people thinking about the importance of graphic novels in raising literacy levels as part of their library collections. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any future discussions. Thanks for listening and good night.